Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mina Fos. I'm the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs um, and the Director of the Peter S. Calico Center for the American Presidency in the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy and International Affairs at Hofstra University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you today to our panel discussion on the state of American politics and presidential leadership. Um, yes, we'll discuss uh, President Biden's address to Congress last night. And what is what, what will be our main focus today will be the results of the spring 2021 Calico School poll. Um, we have much to discuss. If you have a, if you've had a chance to see our announcement online, that you know we released the summary of our poll, which ran in early April 2021. Um, yesterday evening, there was a fine article in Newsday by reporter Scott Idler, who is uh, graciously taking the time to join us today um, and to comment after our Calico School poll program director, Dr. Craig. Greg Burnett shares the survey results. We'll give a quick introduction of each of them in just a moment. Um, let me just please allow me to welcome um, so many students, classes, guests today. I think we have at least four classes present today, and I think the numbers are increasing. I see the numbers going up by the moment. Uh, allow me to just give a very warm welcome to Dr. Feldman's American Political Thought class. Dr. Parati's public opinion and political communication class, Dr. Burnett's public introduction to public policy and public service class, Dr. Labresco's introduction to civic engagement class. These are classes that all meet during this period. In addition, I know that several students from my American presidency class, which just con uh, concluded are here. Some of you are in those other classes. I believe students from Dr. Burnett's um, political analysis and statistics class are also joining joining us today, um, and as well as many other students, faculty, community members, it is, uh, we are so delighted to have you here. Um, I'm deepest thanks to the Hofstra Cultural Center for making this event possible on Zoom, particularly Ms. Carol Mallison, who runs everything so smoothly and welcomed everyone in the chat just now. Also, Ms. Athleen Collins, the executive director. We are most appreciative of the Hofstra President's Office, the Provost's Office, and the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean's Office for uh, supporting this event. And of course, uh, to the founder of the Calico School, Mr. Peter Calico, for um, creating the making the Calico School poll possible. Um, let me just say to provide a quick historical perspective, we first launched the Calico School poll in the fall of 2019. Our first survey was in November 2019. Our second one was in March 2020. Actually ran that survey, uh, I believe it concluded just before um, the World Health Organization declared the COVID crisis a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. Um, and we were all set to host an event on campus. Uh, instead, we did that on Zoom and we haven't looked back since. <laughs> um, we had two Calico School polls in uh, September and October of 2020, which Dr. Burnett and I discussed and uh, Mr. Scott Idler uh, wrote about for Newsday. Um, and then this poll just ran in early April, 2021, our first post-election poll. We plan to, in the fall, uh, continue with doing this once a semester, perhaps twice a semester in national election years. We'll see and as we approach 2022. And our hope is very much that um, when we uh, run the next uh, Calico School Poll event, the next Calico Center event, that we will have a chance to greet many of you in person on our beautiful campus. For today, we have much to discuss, and I am delighted to be participating on this panel uh, with my colleague, Dr. Craig Burnett, Associate Professor of Political Science and Calico School Poll Program Director. Dr. Burnett is an expert in state and local politics, American politics, political methods. He has published extensively in all of these fields, um, is, has done a lot of work in public opinion polling, and we were just absolutely delighted when he um, agreed in the uh, about now almost 
uh, close to two years ago to um, to take on the responsibility of leading the Calico School Poll, which is a national survey administered by the firm YouGov. Uh, all of the intellectual firepower for the poll comes from Dr. Burnett, um, who has worked with several several of our faculty, including myself, Dr. Parati, Dr. Richard Himmelfarb, Dr. Chris Neat in sociology, uh, Executive Dean Larry Levy of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University, and many others. Um, uh, to uh, develop the uh, surveys, the questionnaires for each of our surveys. And um, we are most appreciative of our faculty collaborations and of Dr. Burnett's work. We are delighted that a, a Newsday reporter, Scott Eidler, has uh, taken the time to join us today to provide commentary on how journalists use public opinion polls. Uh, Mr. Eidler covered the March 2020 poll, uh, the survey results, as well as the uh, September and October 2021. So it's nice now that we're kind of completing the election cycle and moving into uh, presidential governance to, uh, to get Mr. Eidler's perspective. Uh, just to give a quick background, Scott Eidler has worked at Newsday since 2012. He is currently the uh, a member of Newsday's government accountability and enterprise team focusing on Nassau County politics and governance, uh, government. Previously, uh, Scott Eidler worked on covering education policy and municipal government. He is a graduate of Cornell University where he earned a bachelor's degree um, in political analysis and management. So very relevant for our public policy and political science students. And he is also a graduate of Columbia University's uh, journalism school's master of science program. He has received received awards from the New York Press Club for continuing coverage and the New York News Publishers Association for distinguished beat reporting. So Scott, we are delighted to have you join us today. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I would encourage everyone on this um, on this uh, uh, Zoom to take a look at uh, Scott's story in Newsday. In fact, I'll, in just a moment, I'll put a link in the chat. But for now, what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna turn the floor over to my colleague, to Dr. Burnett, to discuss the results of the Cal Calico School poll. We'll then, uh, I'll turn to Scott Scott for commentary. Scott, uh, Craig and I will speak for a few moments about a few questions about the poll and then we will open it up for audience questions, try to get as many student questions as we can, also ask some of the faculty members who have joined us. We are turning off the chat for now. When we open it up for Q&A, um, it will be possible for you to include questions there. But with that, uh, lengthy introduction, uh, but so much more I could say about our wonderful panelists. Let me turn it over to Dr. Burnett. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bose. So yeah, I, just to, to piggyback on uh, that this is, this is truly a collaborative effort. You know, we do seek a lot of input and, and invariably there's always probably about 10 more, sometimes 15 questions that we wish we could have asked but we don't have the space for and, it's, and and even without an election uh that that tends to be true and we're able to uh ask a bunch of questions but unfortunately we we can't cover everything as extensively as we'd like so uh this is our 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 attempt to get at what we think is is moving the world of policy and opinion uh as of at least as of late march anyway so uh you know the world has shifted again but uh, let's start uh, with just a, a couple of details on the methodology. I like to get this uh, out there for people, you know, especially because we do have a couple of classes that are more methods focused. Uh, so the sample is 2000 overall. The margin of error for those who, who understand is, is a 2.7. That's a plus or minus on any of these numbers. And, and we do have a suburban focus to our poll. So we do oversample. Uh, suburbanites and we gather 1,000. Their individual level margin of error is plus or minus 3.6. The urban sample and rural sample are 500 apiece with margins of error of 5.8 and 5.4 respectively. We were in the field for a little less than a week uh, from the 12th to 18th. So these are pretty uh, pretty fresh numbers here. And, and thankfully for us, 
Um, unlike in election season, and this has certainly been, I think, the biggest difference for us doing this this time, is you know, we're not trying to predict some specific outcome. We're trying to gather the pulse about where uh, really American politics is at this particular moment. Um, so we'll, we'll start then by jumping into the question that, that I think is naturally, uh, you know, we should be naturally asking around 100 days, which is, how's Biden doing according to, you know, the voters who just elected him or, or might think about either sending him support or taking support away even uh, in, the next, in the next midterm elections? And uh, so far, uh, he's, he's getting little better marks on, on where the direction of the country is going. As you see, I have uh, Trump's readings here going all the way back to the beginning of the, of the Calico School poll. Uh, and that you can, you can see that, that Trump, uh, right before the pandemic really hit, uh, was actually doing pretty well in terms of this number, at least historically for us. Uh, there's a lot of partisanship that goes into this number, so uh, we can't we can't read it, you know, as, as as just truly the right measure of the direction of the country. But uh, we think over time we can kind of see these undulations. So he's doing a little better, but you know, not really a whole lot. I mean, things are starting to change, but but there isn't some sort of fundamental difference that's changed uh, since October. The economy is still something in a tattered shape. Uh, and, and up until March, you know, uh, we're still dealing with the pandemic. So, uh, you know, there, there's definitely been um, some positive movement, uh, but also I think when we look at his, his job approval, which is one of those, those numbers we can really kind of get down and say, okay, what, what is, where, where is the public at with the president's performance? Uh, and again, I have the historical numbers here for Trump, and you can kind of see that he was always around that 50, low, uh, you know, high 40s, and a lot of other polling outfits had him in that sub 50 number. And then when the pandemic hit, his his numbers in our polls and, and just about every poll that was out there took a hit. Biden's number uh, for us is 52.6, which is higher than Trump, uh, but it's not exceptionally high as far as presidencies go in their first hundred days. If you look at you know historically where presidents have started in the past, they tend to do better than this. Uh, there's a lot of reasons as to why that might be the case, uh, some of which I think is that he's, he's a relatively known figure, uh, has something to do with it. the fact that he was vice president for eight years, throw in a hyper-polarized environment, and we might be seeing um, you know, a different response as a result. Um, favorability. Uh, it largely matches his job approval. And, and as you can see, historically, we've been tracking uh, Trump and Biden for this whole time that we've been doing the poll. And you can see actually at the beginning that Trump was slightly, you know, doing slightly better in his favorables. And then really, again, the post, you know, pandemic hits as we approach election day, Biden's numbers go up, Trump's go down. And they've been very consistent around that 51 and a half, 52 percent for Biden, uh, that has not changed. Um, when we look at the issues in terms of what voters think, and, and to keep in mind, these are registered voters, not likely voters since there's not an upcoming election. Um, it's interesting to look to see, maybe this is a sense of normalcy emerging here and that we see the economy is clearly the front runner in terms of issues that matter, uh, things that are in the news a lot, crime, immigration, those matter. Education is one that, that's popped up. Healthcare important. And we looked at this and COVID-19 actually ranks as the seventh out of the 10th issues in terms of importance here. I also would highlight that climate change does the worst on this metric. And we're gonna come back to some numbers in the climate change uh, realm that I, I just wanna point out that for a lot of people, this does not, you know, climate change does not strike as the, the most important. But the fact that, that COVID is the seventh out of 10th, uh, you know, I would I would wager that's probably uh, good news overall. Um, but also, if you're Biden, then that's also the best issue you're doing, uh, that you're getting high marks for is your response to COVID-19. So it could be, you know, this is, this is something of a chicken or an egg question here. Is it because people think Biden's doing a good job that they don't think that it's an important issue anymore? Or is it that they still think it's about as important, but it also happens to be the, the job he's doing the best? Uh, I suspect it's probably a bit of, a bit of both, but it, 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 in part, I think the fact that he is getting such high net ratings on his handling of COVID-19 suggests that, that probably people feel a little better 
about it and don't think it's such a pressing issue anymore. But you can see he's doing well in, on COVID. He's doing you know, reasonably well in the economy. I don't have them up here, but Trump's numbers were uh, about a plus five uh, when he was uh, when the economy was doing really well back in, in March of 2020. So the fact he's getting a 3.8 is, is relatively good considering that, that Trump was in a stronger position in March of last year. Uh, where he's not doing so well uh, is immigration. And I think we can attribute this to the saliency of the issue. The fact that, that this is making the nightly news or, is, or at least has been making the nightly news very consistently. Uh, crime and race relations, two other areas where he's not uh, doing as well, according to voters. We just watched his, his, his big speech last night and you know some of that's gonna come back to how are, how are people rec receiving the, the policy proposals he's putting forward. Right now, uh, on the American Rescue Plan Act, which was the first of 1.9 trillion, uh, however you wanna describe it, but the sort of stimulus package, if you will, uh, people liked it uh, and people, people like it. Um, you know, obviously there's some partisan splits here, you know, Republicans are against it, but he's doing well amongst independents. He's doing well amongst uh, all sorts of splits in the suburban, rural, and even rural. Uh, but overall it's popular in 65. Uh, roughly 65%. We then asked people if they thought the cash payments were too much, too little, or about right. Uh, and, and predominantly people seemed to think they were either about right or that actually they could have used a little more. Uh, again, you can see there's, there's pretty big partisan differences between Democrats and Republicans, uh, but independents are much closer to Democrats on this number. Uh, than they are, are Republicans. So, uh, you know, he was worried about going too small, I think. And uh, it, it turns out people like to get money from the government. Uh, I didn't know if that was known before, but it is now. And so uh, he's proposed now a 2.2 trillion and, and we've subsequently now seen at least a preview of even the third proposed package. We only knew about the first one when we were in the field. So this is where it stands in terms of his uh, American jobs plan as, as he's coined it. Uh, again, the partisan splits are there, but, but the, the idea of spending money on all sorts of uh, types of initiatives, including you know infrastructure, is a popular one amongst voters. And even when we asked about the the potential trade offs uh, for taxes, uh, we didn't see a huge decline in support. So so at least in concept, they're they're quite popular. Um, race relations is one of those ongoing issues that's been of, of particular importance to us. Uh, and we noticed in our own data last fall uh, that after the summer of 2020, race relations amongst our sample had been, you know, we'd seen a pretty significant shift from, in some cases, actually thinking that things were getting better to clearly getting worse to now 60, and in the April poll, that's continued. At 65.5% of people think that race relations is getting worse. It goes to show that there's some consistency to this issue that doesn't go away. Uh, when you change administrations, that, that certainly most of the public feels the same way about this. And we see in other issues that we do see a, a pretty significant shift in how people view things, uh, in particular, the economy is one of those. So we don't see the same thing in race relations, um, just as sort of a side note for people who are, who are looking at this from a public opinion standpoint. We had the ability over the last three polls to ask people about uh, the policy of defunding the police. And so we did what's called an experiment in political science. It's a social science tool to look to see how people respond when you frame a policy one way versus another. And so in one policy frame, uh, we described uh, the defunding the police, if you will, policy as a reallocation of funds away from police uh, to other services. Uh, when we introduced the defunding the police firm, we used the exact same description as we did in reallocating the, fund, uh, reallocating the funds firm, but we described it as uh, the, the process of defunding the police. And as you can see here from the numbers, given at which survey you, you look at, uh, you're looking at about a 12 point drop in support. Uh, when you tell uh, individuals that this is the policy of defunding the police. And so it seems amongst the public uh, just the way in which we talk about this kind of policy change is going to matter a great deal. And policy advocates are going to have to, to wage war over really which sort of viewpoint is presented to not only policymakers, but also to the, to the public who could support or oppose it. Um, we've had a rash, unfortunately, of, 
of mass shooting events in this country that, that really picked up as the new year started. Um, and here we've, we've broken out the numbers for every time we've asked about additional gun control laws. And just like we've noticed before, they're extremely polarized and extremely stable. And I don't, I can't think of another issue in American politics where I think the equilibrium is just stuck and, and I don't expect any movement on it, but we find the exact same kinds of numbers uh, amongst uh, our sample as we did in, in April compared to any other point uh, in, our, in our poll. We asked respondents about climate change. We asked them if they thought it was a serious problem. Uh, there is a split here, obviously, and it's a pretty big split, but I, I will point out that there are more Republicans now starting to say that they think the problem is either very serious or somewhat serious, just as sort of a trend over the last 15 years. Obviously, we don't have Calico school polls going back that far. But if you look at other sources of information on this issue, there is some change. However, it is still very partisan. Uh, but there is this sense amongst independents that the, the problem is probably growing and it's becoming more serious. Uh, we also ask people about the reasons why they might have their particular opinion on climate change. And we asked about whether or not it was something to do with their children, grandchildren, future generations, if they're worried about future economic pro uh, opportunities, if they're worried about the value of their property, the impact on the rest of the world, or an increase in immigration, which actually we thought uh, might happen to certain subgroups of the population more than others. Uh, it turns out that, that most people actually are, are, are highlighting that future generations are probably the most important issue for them. Not so much property. Uh, we didn't put the numbers up here, but the, the question about impact on the rest of the world has a huge partisan split. Uh, a lot more uh, Democrats think this is an important reason versus uh, Republicans. COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we asked people about their plans, uh, have or will receive the vaccine in the near future. Um, and you can see overall, it's about 69%. Uh, there's about 30, 31% almost that do not plan to get vaccinated. And these numbers are really accentuated amongst Republicans and independents. And we're looking at Republicans as only 53.4% claiming they're going to get a vaccine uh, in the near future. When we look at what people think should be required, if a vaccine should be required for certain kinds of activities, uh, you can see the partisan splits here. Democrats are, are strongly supportive of every kind of activity we asked about, which was should it be required to go back to school, college, get on an airplane, go back to your office to work under normal conditions, go to the movie theater, sports, entertainment of some kind. There's not strong support amongst the public for this. It's in the 50s for a couple and it's in the 40s for one. And you don't find that it's not a 70% and there's just some outlier group that disagrees with this. This is going to be, I think, a pretty significant point of contention going forward. And I think you might actually see some divergence in terms of policy outcomes based on who's actually in charge of the state. So I think you're gonna find more restrictions in democratic controlled states and probably fewer restrictions in Republican controlled states. We asked about the January 6th assault on the Capitol building, and there's a pretty divergent view about how they, they thought the, what they actually thought the assault was. Most Democrats view it as an insurrection. Most Republicans see it as an out of, out of hand protest. Uh, we see a big split between insurrection and out of hand protest for independence, but the majority of people overall see it as, as an insurrection and, and then the next third or so is an out of hand protest. Uh, as you see amongst Republican respondents, 27% uh, thought it was you know, akin to a normal rally. Um, they didn't really find much, you know, those, those percentage of people didn't find much wrong, of which there's 18 and a half um, independents as well. We also asked who people thought won the 2020 presidential election. Obviously we have a new president. Um, we knew that this would get different responses than what we knew the obvious one was. So we wanted to see how different they were. And it turns out that almost you know, 38%, uh, you know, only 38% of Republicans think that Joe Biden won and you know, almost 62% of Republicans think that Donald Trump won. Independence is 67, 32, but there's still overall 30% of the registered voting public 
thinks that Donald Trump won the election. And it, it's sort of, this is a concerning number because there is at least, you know, 30% who just think that the president in the White House is not uh, legitimate. We also asked about the filibuster and we, we've asked about this at, at another point too. Uh, the numbers haven't changed a whole lot. There's, there's about, it's, a, it's about, uh, you know, 50-50 in terms of support. Um, in terms of uh, support for a talking filibuster, which was one of the things that Manchin had potentially thrown out as a reform, uh, there's actually reasonable support for that at about 60%, more popular amongst Democrats uh, than anyone else. Um, we also had the opportunity to ask people if they were paying more or less attention to politics uh, since Biden has taken office. And as you can see, about 33% of, uh, of the overall sample said they're paying less attention. Turns out actually it's more Republicans than anyone else. And I'm not sure why exactly that's the case. Maybe it's because uh, uh, there's no longer a Republican in the White House and, and, and they're not controlling Congress. So maybe they're paying more less attention. At least that's, that's what we reported. And so that breaks down the numbers uh, of, the, of the key findings. There was more in our executive summary that we don't have a, as much time to go through. So I, I would urge everybody uh, to, to look that over. Uh, and we have the additional slides here if, if anybody wants to ask a question about them. But I'll turn it back over to, uh, to you, Dr. Bose. Okay, thank you. For, thank you. Um, and you know, you're, that's a perfect segue because I'm gonna turn to Scott Eidler in just a moment, but I wanted to uh, raise one point. I'm gonna put a link to the news release, which includes the link to the executive summary in the chat in a moment. And I um, must give our Great thanks to Ms. Carla Schuster for uh, writing the news release and working with us on every step of the process from the first poll to the present. Um, I also think, uh, Dr. Burnett, as you were talking about uh, climate change, I'm reminded we had a faculty member from sustainability studies, uh, Dr. Bernhardt, who also um, was very helpful with our uh, the survey questions and comments. And so thanks for that. Dr. Burnett, I'm gonna just ask one question before we uh, have our panel discussion. Um, and this reflects some of the kind of the questions that came up after we, as you and I were looking at this poll results, we were very fortunate um, that we did our last panel uh, the day before the presidential election. So we didn't have to address in November, 2020, all of the criticism <laughs> that came up after the election results, when there were so many questions about how were the polls off in over predicting Biden's victory, issues with uh, congressional races, et cetera. And without getting too much into the details, I'm just wondering, you shared at the beginning the sample, the margin of error. Um, what do we, how do we account for um, what appears to be this, this discrepancy, right, between what the surveys showed in November 2020 and the election results. How does that affect our efforts to, um, to, to, to kind of to discuss the, uh, the accuracy of polling, recognizing that perhaps um, the respondents may not be the representative sample of the population that we have seen in the past before 2020? Yeah, there's there's a lot that we could talk about. Um, I, I will hit a couple of points, though. Uh, the first is that it has gotten a lot harder over the last 10 years to do public opinion research. It's, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where we've had a, sample, you know, a, a good sampling frame uh, that we understand, you know, what it's like to go out and get those people and, and the expectation about how to do that. Um, it's become significantly more difficult to do uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, the second thing I would point out is that there now seems to be something very specifically different about Trump voters in survey responses. And they actually are, as we, we did our own postmortem talking with our own survey provider, um, it's actually just more difficult to get them to respond to surveys and that that needs to be accounted for in some way. And so you've noticed the, you know, sort of the how off surveys have been, in particular with 2016 and 2020, yet for a lot of the other polls in between, they've been pretty good. And so it might just be that, that Trump is one of these, these candidates who's very hard to get an accurate snapshot on. 
Um, but you know, you take that together and, and you, you sort of always have to keep in mind that there's going to be some fluctuation in polls. And we're not, you know, predicting off of polls is, is, is difficult um, and, and really probably should, you know, and I think it's sort of a, a public as we consume information, we tend to think of, 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 of opinion polls as sort of like accurate. And, and they have been, but uh, to, for, for you know, a lot of it, but at the same time, they really, there's a lot of probability-based uh, analysis and assumptions that go into it that we shouldn't be placing it as some sort of certainty. Um, and and that, that's, that's what I would also just sort of guide people to think about this, that this is a snapshot in time. Uh, and you know, in, in a couple more weeks, something could change. And we won't, you know, the snapshot we had in April would, would no longer make sense for May. Okay, thank you. Um, let me turn, um, there are so many topics to discuss. I think I'd like to begin by asking our panelist, uh, Scott, I'd love to share your thoughts, Scott. You've covered four of our Calico School polls now. You write about politics daily. Um, what are your, what, could you comment on what, how what you found interesting in the poll and maybe more generally how you as a political journalist um use polls in your uh writing and analysis sure well first thank you dr bose dr burnett for having me it's a privilege to be here and uh it's so much fun to cover these polls because they cover every issue you're thinking about even a year ago before the pandemic you know, we were having this conversation right as lockdown was having and, um, you know, and then things changed so quickly. You know, Bernie, the first story I wrote was, you know, Bernie Sanders was, you know, favored by uh, suburban voters along with, you know, more than President Trump at the time, which is just a fascinating, um, you know, data point to find. So for us, when we, well, for me, when we look at these polls, we're, you know, Craig has done the work, the consulting firm has done the work. We're trying to frame it in a conversational way. What what is the point that you're gonna you're gonna talk to your friend about, talk to your spouse about? You know, what's the the thing you want to share in conversation? So that's that's what we're trying to do in in putting these stories together. And they're they're fascinating because they provide so much context for the issues. When you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were writing about a state effort to promote, you know, has, you know, to promote confidence. There was a, an ad blitz to promote confidence in the vaccine. And it's so important to put in the story, you know, if there's data, how much, what percent of the public lacks confidence in the vaccine. And, you know, to see that, that it's 30% overall, you know, this high figure among Republicans, that's something you're talking about, but to actually document it, uh, you know, backs up your claim, backs up why you're writing about it. You, you're not just writing about it. You're not just speaking, you know, spontaneously. So that's so important is to have this, you know, we're, we're not looking at these to say, you know, were these 100% spot on, you know, afterwards. We're showing that this is what this analysis captured. And we frame it in the context of all the other polls that are done. And so that's that's really important too. The other interesting takeaway is how much the polling and the, if the polling drives policy. And you've seen this in the Biden administration so far. They have polled the public about the American Rescue Plan and the infrastructure plan that's before the Congress right now. And you know, you're looking in this data, uh, 64%, 65% on both packages. The first one didn't pass with any Republican votes. The second one might be the same situation. So that's, you can see how the White House is reframing the argument of bipartisanship. You know, they believe that the issue has bipartisan support, maybe not bipartisan vote counting. Maybe, you know, it's a lopsided vote, but they're, they're using this to as justification, not specifically the Calico poll, but polls that back up, you know, this popular support for these 
legislative initiatives. And that's what's so important. I mean, you're wondering why they're not running to do gun control right now. They're handling issues where they have, you know, they're, as you mentioned, the, this poll came out on day 100. You've got, talk about the context, you've got the honeymoon period for a new presidency. And, you know, as Dr. Burnett said, that may not exist in the Biden administration. He's a known figure, but he's he's tackling one issue at a time. And, you know, it's to be determined whether and when he'll, you know, start talking about some of the more polarizing issues. He's definitely done executive orders. Uh, the Attorney General Merrick Garland has done executive actions, but on the legislative front, they're following the highest public opinion polling. And that's, that's shaping the presidential agenda right now, which is very interesting. Yeah, no, no, thank you for bringing that up and, and raising these issues, um, Scott, that just point out, I think, how much polling helps us to interpret what is happening in Washington, right? Sure. This national yeah. service, what the president, especially at this 100 day mark of the Biden administration, yeah. what are the priorities and what will happen going forward? Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if we could actually, um, Craig, if you could turn to the slide with the approval ratings and the favorability ratings for Biden. So maybe the three of us could talk about that for a, um, uh, a few minutes. Um, I think it was the one right after this, right? Uh, well, I mean, that, you want yeah. favorables or you want approval? Oh, I, yeah, I guess I was looking at both of them. Well, let's keep approval because favorability may, mirrors the approval rating, as you say on the next slide. But I'm curious, you know, we, you, we illustrate here and the Calico School poll is consistent with many other national polls. Former President Trump never polled a majority right, uh, got kind of close in March of 2020. But in contrast, his successor, President Biden, has been in the low 50s when he took office and is, is consistently there now, a kind of a solid, slender, nevertheless solid majority. Um, it seems to me that there is quite a bit of uh, room for discussion as to what kind of a mandate um, maybe not using that in the social scientific term, but just wonder what kind of momentum perhaps this gives the president for action. And Scott was just referring to that, right? Whether how the White House will interpret this public opinion, support for specific policies with the rescue plan, the jobs plan, the families plan, um, what are priorities and what issues such as gun control, which President Biden mentioned last night, of course, did discuss re uh, reinstating the assault weapons ban, et cetera. But why, as our poll shows, why that might not be immediate in the White House agenda. I'm just wondering, um, you know, uh, Dr. Burnett, Scott Eidler, if, if the two of you would have thoughts on, I certainly do, on how much of a window for action the president's majority approval, narrow majority approval rating and favorability rating, uh, how much of a window that brings for action? Well, they're walking, sorry, did you want to? No, go ahead. They're what he's the administration is walking obviously a tightrope. They have the slimmest of margins and they're they're concerned about losing the house in in 2022. So everything that they do has to be very calculated. You heard some some remarks leaked yesterday. They were on the record with the news anchors. They said they wanted a big win right out of the gate, and that was COVID relief, um, the American Rescue Package. And that has you know, very high support, as you mentioned, with the cash payments. So um, that is not necessarily a mandate, um, but there's also no opponent in the picture. So there's no, he's not running against anyone. So there's that, you know, that could influence the 52.6%. You know, you were looking at, we were writing about these head-to-head -head margins uh, with Biden and Trump last year. So that's an interesting, you know, we won't know until, you know, the next, four years Calico poll to, to see uh, the numbers for, you know, a first term president, um, if they'll ever get back to uh, Obama level of the 60s. And that that also could be a reflection of how divided the country is um, to, you know, media ecosystems going on um, with, uh, you know, you see that in the 30% who don't believe he's the legitimate president. Um, I don't know if we've ever seen a figure for any presidency like that before. So 
that's a different, we're in a different political ecosystem and that, you know, that, that could be driving it as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if I were, if I were in the White House advising the president, uh, I probably look at this number and, and I, I probably would have expected it given all of the you know, sort of fundamentals. But if I were looking at this as sort of a policy strategy, I might say, well, we didn't start in the 60s. So we can't try to ride the wave of popularity and use the bully pulpit to get what I want because people like me. Um, in fact, actually, I probably need to make sure that my numbers stay in the 50s and I can hopefully raise them over time as we approach the midterms and beyond. And so I probably actually would advise uh, learning from you know, uh, his, you know, one of his predecessors when Obama was enjoying uh, you know, 60 plus approval ratings, had 60 members in the Senate um, and, and didn't really walk away with a whole lot. Uh, and then, you know, watch his popularity decline and then get mired down uh, in previous Congresses uh, and not getting a whole lot done after that. I would probably be going um, gung ho on trying to get everything I can pass and hope that it'll be popular enough uh, in the short, medium and long term uh, that I can protect my members of Congress who are up for re-election. Um, you know, if, if I'm worried about losing seats, right, it's almost impossible to gain seats, but maybe I can protect as many as possible. Uh, maybe I can hold on to the Senate. Uh, and, you know, you have, you have a decent playing field in the Senate. Maybe you can make a pitch uh, to voters that, that were maybe previous Trump voters that they should go out and support um, my preferred Senate candidates. But that's how I would be approaching this is, is sort of, you have kind of a two year window uh, you're not going to be able to just go out there as Mr. Popular and get everything done. You're going to have to kind of get, you know, nose the grindstone, push stuff through any way you can. I think this data sh explains why they're, they're going piecemeal, you know, going through the process, going through, you know, they're not saying let's, it's time to kill the filibuster. We're going to go through budget reconciliation for this uh, the American Rescue Plan, and, you know, we're going to invite the Republicans to the White House, and, you know, we're going to, you know, have them over, and, you know, they're going through the, you know, how the sausage is made, you know, you know the, the lawmaking process, and, you know, President Biden, you know, was a senator for decades, and um, that's how he's choosing to legislate. We'll see as time goes on if he's going to blow things up, you know, they're probably going to want to replace a Supreme Court justice with this window. I mean, the, the clock is ticking. Uh, it's early. And obviously, you know, in 2022, that's an election year. It's going to be very difficult to get some of the, uh, those, those measures, uh, more controversial ones. But they're walking, again, they're walking this fine line between, you know, what, what they have popular support for. Um, if it drags out too long, you know, they, they do lose some of that window though. I think that's an inter it's a very interesting tension that both of you are bringing up here with um, the window is really even less than two years, right? In, president, mm -hmm. in the presidency studies, we typically say 12 to 18 months of a new mm -hmm. administration before focus turns fully to the midterms. Mm -hmm. And um, with a razor thin majority in the Senate for the Democrats, right? The, the vice president needed to cast the tie breaking vote as mm -hmm. Vice President Harris has done already um, in in the new in the hundred days, um, and a very slim majority in the House. It seems as though this narrow margin, narrow majority of public approval, can serve to strengthen the president's case for moving forward. Albeit, and I think um, Scott, it's it's a good point. Uh, moving forward, kind of piecemeal with these stages of legislation, rather than kind of all at once. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. I'm also, I had neglected to put into the chat the link to Hofstra's news release. I have put in um, the link to Scott's article and I'll, I'll add, um, I'll add uh, our uh, Hofstra summary in, in just a moment. But let me just, I want to, before I open it up and maybe I'll turn in a moment to um, uh, Dr. Parati and Dr. Feldman and Dr. Labresco. If you, I know you've all brought classes. If you have quick questions before we open it up to students, I'll do that. But I want to focus on the suburban um, voters because 
in our poll, Dr. Burnett, right, we oversampled suburban voters. Half of our sample is suburban nationally, right? Not Long Island, national suburban, 500 urban, 500 rural. Yet it seems to me that the more interesting data post-election are the comparisons of the splits on party lines rather than urban, suburban, rural. You see the strongest support among urban voters for the president's policy agenda. Suburban is close behind and rural tends to be a little lower, right? And so, yes, thank you for putting that up. And I'm just curious though, but when you look at the, the sharp splits, this is perfect uh, to show this, right? Democrats, 97% for the rescue plan, uh, Republicans, 32%. What, um, and then we can go for, we could take this forward with the cash payments and the other policies. Are the more interesting insights in this poll the party divisions, um, or are there more that we can glean from the suburban versus urban and rural voters that might be instructive, particularly as we look ahead to the midterms? Yeah, well, I mean, I, we sort of gravitate to the partisan splits because they, you know, they, they sort of will tell us which way the wind is blowing. It's a little harder to tell, uh, you know, maybe intuitively what's, you know, if you look at it from a geographic point of view, but, you know, the, the overwhelming thing now having done this um, several iterations is that uh, suburbanites and, and urbanites and, and, and rural residents, they, they have very similar patterns to their responses, almost in lockstep from one survey to the next. And that we're finding that suburbanites are really truly somewhere right in the middle. Um, they have elements and they have concerns and they behave much closer to urbanites in some ways. And then in other ways, they, they tend to lean more toward what their rural counterparts look like. And so uh, I think it reinforces the sort of adage that you know, really how the suburbs go is ultimately the way that politics is going to go, especially when you look at the elections and, ele and election outcomes, and that especially when you're thinking about national elections. And that e even though you could say, um, you know, that uh, it, it, you know, polling is, is, is struggles to get things right precisely. You can, I think, still take quite a bit away from the longer term and the more stable effects that you, that you note. And, you know, one of the things we were saying all the way through up, you know, until the election was that the suburbs looked like they had turned away from Trump and, they, and all the metrics we could find um, that was the case. And so I do think it, it's, it's good to sort of have an accounting about, you know, what the suburban vote is thinking. And there, you know, when, when you see that over, you know, you're looking at getting close to two thirds of people uh, think that the American Rescue Plan was a good idea. Um, that means it's pretty popular in most places. And that, you know, the, 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 the average suburban voter uh, is going to, you know, is, is assuming they're ha happy with this in, in another year or two, um, you know, is it maybe in a position to reward Biden for taking strong action uh, early on in his administration. But right now it's popular. And it's not just something that's popular in the urban areas and really unpopular in rural areas. It's not. It's actually popular all over. Please, Scott. Yeah, I was going to. The suburban data is so important. It Newsday, obviously, you know, that's our readership. Uh, I remember we three of us were talking in the fall about how uh, Biden had the lead among suburban women from 54 and 50 to 43 percent. And Dr. Bose, you had said, you know, there were all, all that coverage about how, you know, this was exit polling that Hillary had, you know, possibly had not done as well as she could have with that demographic group. Um, so that was, you know, a sign that you know, things were breaking uh, for now President Biden. The other interesting data about the suburbs, and we've seen this on Long Island in the coverage, um, this kind of, you know, Democrats tying them to the city and, you know, gang violence. I mean, you heard some of this rhetoric from President Trump, you know, you're going to be living next to MS-13. Um, you heard this in the uh, Laura Curran, the current county executive race four years ago, there was that, you know, there were those advertisements, 
you know, trying to link Democrats to inviting MS-13, and it, it doesn't seem to work, and, and people reject that, uh, you know, that level of discourse. So that wasn't effective, it doesn't seem. Um, and the other interesting point about the suburbs is, and we'll know this for sure in the fall of 2022, but whatever they, um, wh what are the advertisings it's going to be? What are the commercials going to be? We saw in 2018 that Democrats won the House by every, every subject was health care. And that, you know, the Republicans, you know, had attempted to repeal Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. That, that was a huge a real issue uh, that suburb, suburban residents felt strongly about, and it was extremely effective. And they, you know, they used it with, with COVID essentially uh, in the fall as a, as a real issue in the campaign. So, you know, whatever the messaging is, I, I think this is strategic what's going on, you know, passage of the American Rescue Plan and infrastructure. I mean, the Democrats will be able to message, um, communicate, next in two falls that you know they got fourteen hundred dollars into your pockets and they built roads and bridges and it's you know in your neighborhood and these members of congress even if they didn't vote for the package they're going to take credit for it as well um you've kind of seen seen some of that going on so um the suburban viewpoint they that covers so many house races and that's that's just key key to the messaging no, I agree. And, you know, I would add, you know, the, the thing that I was just reading the other day is that um, these tax, these are essentially tax cuts. And it's sort of flipping the script from what Democrats are used to. And they've, they've issued more tax cuts uh, than, than was from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act. Uh, and so it's sort of, sort of an interesting, it's going to be, to Scott's point, it's going to be interesting to see what that messaging is and how they run. Are they gonna explicitly run on, hey, we gave the middle class a pretty substantial tax cut. You should vote us in so you can keep those. Um, I don't know, I mean, or, or do Republicans, how do, and, and really sort of more curious, how do Republicans spin that exactly? You know, obviously Republicans think it was too much, but if you had told them it was a middle class tax cut, you know, what would Republicans think of that and how would how would voters respond? I, I'm now more curious about it than anything else. It will be interesting to see because, of course, President Biden said last night, called on Congress to make the um, the cash payments permanent, right, to make the to uh, to institute this as legislation to continue to kind of invest in um, invest in people to rebuild the economy. Um, and I think both of you have raised such important points about now that we're out of an election season, uh, the focus seems to be more on kind of the party divisions, but the importance of voters and particularly the suburban swing voters as we look ahead to the midterms continues to be very important. I have several follow-up questions, but in the interest of time and uh, incorporating our uh, audience, I'm opening the chat right now so that students can start to put questions in. I'd like to ask um, Dr. Parati if, um, if she has a question and then uh, Dr. Labresco and Dr. Feldman, if you have questions as well. We'll turn to you after that. And then we'll, uh, students, you're most welcome to start putting questions in the chat and we'll get to them in just, it gives you a few minutes while your faculty um, start to uh, open the discussion. So Dr. Parati. Yeah, I have two comments that might stimulate questions from students. Um, two things that were really, really interesting to me, and I, I have to hand it to Dr. Burnett for um, including these in the survey and interpreting in the way that you did, uh, were the, the idea that it's not just that the polling drives the policy, the polling drives the message, the Green New Deal, um, looking at that, the effect of that term, and also comparing the effect of that term to the effect of defunding the police tells us that um, when you are, you know, when you are um, using a term to frame a particular policy initiative, it's extremely important. Um, so students think about that Green, green New Deal as a term. Um, will it, he talked last night about the importance of jobs 
that term jobs is connoted by the term New Deal. And that may be the reason this is not such a turnoff um, to, to conservatives as we think, you know, as for instance, defunding the police. Um, second thing is uh, when you asked people what were what issues they're concerned about, what really really struck me was that race and climate change really were were of less concern. And I think to the students who we teach every day, they would probably be of greatest concern. It's almost as if public opinion is stood up on its head. Um, the way that young people think about things and the way that um, older people think about things. Um, as far as a question, I hope that at some point, and not right away, because I want to give the questions to the students, I, I hope that um, Scott could tell us a little bit about how he decided to, what the headline would be for this story, or at least what the lead would be for this story, which I know he has some <laughs> determination about. But I don't want him to answer that right now. I want students to have a chance to ask their questions. Scott, if you want to answer that quickly, you can. <laughs> sure. It seemed that the main takeaway, uh, the biggest news nugget was the the number, the the 52.6 percent. And uh, obviously that he had big backing for his first two legislative accomplishments. So I, I thought to, you know, put that in one, you know, concise sentence, um, you know, as he neared his 100 days and then kind of go into the the more, uh, the, you know, the smaller points. Thank you. Um, Dr. Burnett, did you want to respond to any of the- I, You know, I, I was going to thank Dr. Parati for bringing up the Green New Deal. And I just wanted, I put the slide up to give a little context as to what uh, what's going on. So we asked about support for various parts of the Green New Deal, the ones that were sort of more concrete that you could pull out of the statement. Um, and, and it turns out actually, you know, as he's gone and proposed multiple uh, versions of what to do next, Biden has, has actually adopted much of the Green New Deal in his own proposals. Um, so we, we asked this two ways. We asked uh, whether they would support uh, this, this sort of energy related proposal. And then it, for half the sample, we told them that this was a part of the Green New Deal thinking that like we, you know, what we saw with uh, defund the police, that there would be a pretty big effect around the framing of the issue. And there wasn't, but the interesting thing was that it was positive, which mm -hmm. I'm still not fully sure how to take that, but it certainly tells me that the branding of Green New Deal is not bad at this point. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it might change, it, it likely will change once everybody gets done dealing with it in the real politics of American politics. But right now, it actually produces a positive effect overall. Thank you. Now, I should just say we have a few questions coming into the chat to everyone. I've received a direct question as well. So I'm going to turn to those in just a couple of minutes. So please, uh, thank you, everyone. We're going to keep going. Uh, Dr. Feldman, did you want uh, to? Oh, yes. I have a question. Um, where do you get the people uh, that you poll? So we contract out with YouGov, which is an international polling firm, and they have a panel of respondents that then uh, get fed the link to take the survey, and then they, you know, they match them based on a number of demographics. Um, so it's, it's totally uh, on their end, and it's their proprietary uh, you know, functions that get us the sample. So we, we don't handle the data, but we handle end-to-end -end design and analysis. So it's nationwide. When you say, for instance, suburban, it could be Suffolk County, but it could also be anywhere else in the country. Correct. Thank That's you. Fine. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to take advantage of, of that question uh, just to do a, a quick uh, two follow-ups that have come up, one directly to me and one in the chat. Um, a question that came to everybody uh, in the chat was, how do you manage the fact that many people don't answer calls? Of course, this was an online survey, but nevertheless, I think this this question about the demographic who does answer, how do, um, Dr. Renev, you can kind of speak to that a little bit, kind of uh, how do we um, manage the fact that uh, it's a, the YouGov has a panel, right? And a certain number of people choose to participate. Yeah, I mean, you, you can never ensure that you're going to have some perfect sample, 
uh, that that we cannot do. Uh, what we can what we can say is we've looked at performance of how their surveys perform, um, and this is part of that process of us, you know, figuring out who we, were, which vendor we were going to work with, uh, and and they did very well. Uh, and and putting aside that everybody has had issues in 2016 and 2020. With those asides, they've done very well. And I think generally produce a very nice product for us. Um, in terms of getting people to answer, I mean, obviously we cited uh, that some Trump voters in 2020 were just really hard to get to answer surveys. And that, that had a direct effect on the estimates that most polling agencies were producing. Um, and there's not really a, a on the fly fix for that. Uh, you try to do the best with the sample you have and you weight the responses according to what you know about the population. But if you have this sort of systematic bias in your collection of responses, um, there's no easy fix. And so you, you only, unfortunately, with, with things like post-election results, can you really kind of figure out what was wrong. Uh, with these kinds, and I, I would say, uh, you know, just to differentiate a little bit, uh, with the kind of poll that we're releasing today, we're not really as focused on the horse race element, who's going to win the election. Uh, that's what the margin of error is for. And it seems, you know, e even if Trump voters are less reluctant uh, to answer surveys, which we know about, uh, they probably have a very similar policy point of view as we find in other people in our sample. So they're gonna get represented in some way on their opinions. But when it comes specifically to maybe a horse race type of question, that would be a little bit more concerning. But we don't, we don't have that here. And, and the truth is that we're, this is something that's going to evolve over the court. You know, it's, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly improving. Uh, but this particular shortfall, I think is, is you know, most people are thinking very critically about. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Labresco. Uh, thanks, thanks. Um, so I, I, I have to say that maybe, maybe this is like Roseanne, it's more like a comment and then people can build off of it later. But, um, but I'm really struck by, since in my, in my civic engagement class, we were looking at the National Issues Forum voting booklet. And the final choice in that booklet is about changing that the system is screwed up with respect to the Electoral College and the Senate, that that's even as important, perhaps more important than uh, voter suppression issues because it's baked into the system. And I am struck by seeing stats like uh, that 64.7% overall support the rescue plan and not one Republican voted for it. I am struck by how the, how the polling uh, suggests of how the, the problems are baked into the system. Um, and and, and uh, like small d democ democratic <laughs> um, uh, participation that, that if 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 64.7 and not one Republican voted for it, and then just just to add to that, if you're watching, and not just listening last night, but watching people get up and down as they do during Biden's speech, uh, you know, not one Republican got up for cutting child poverty in half. Not one Republican got up for um, for fixing the lead in pipes. <laughs> Like really? So it, it's 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 stunning, really, to think about the polling data of where people are at in the country versus these zero votes from that side of the aisle for these wildly popular things. People want more money in the stimulus. They want more money in their pockets. I assume they want the lead fixed in their pipes, and yet it's zero. It's it's zero on that side of the aisle. So that's. A comment. <laughs> yeah, and actually, Dr. Rubesco, if I can take that very helpful comment, and, and actually one of the first questions that came up in the chat was, it seems that we have two realities in America seemingly divided by political party. Um, that certainly our poll results seem to reflect that. However, question is, I'll say this division may be more likely due to where people get their news, uh, Fox News versus CNBC, the challenge of conveying information and readership. And I'm just, uh, I'm wondering if both, um, if both of our panelists would, would like to comment on this, uh, this 
kind of the the difficulty of uh, of of getting bipartisan support, even if there is uh, seemingly strong public support for legislation, and then the challenge, particularly for for journalists, of um, getting uh, people to uh, to uh, um, engage with information that is it uh, to to be to uh, maybe not engage with, but to be critical consumers of information. So, uh, Craig, I don't know if you want to begin with talking about the issue of the two realities. Yeah. So, I mean, you're asking about bipartisanship, and I just don't see it happening. Um, we're we're at probably a low point in terms of Congress being able to function very well. It's not, it, you know, American politics. Really, no politics is is designed to work under these levels of polarization. It, it is it is in fact, I think, part of that we are, we, we do get our news from different sources. Uh, we do view the world differently. Our opinion leaders couldn't be farther apart in terms on the kinds of things they're telling us. Um, you know, the fact that you, you could have, you know, al almost two thirds of one political party believe that the president in the White House did not win the election um, is something that I think 10 years ago, I would have laughed in anyone's face. Uh, that, you know, there, there's sort of these kinds of basic rules of that we accept in American politics, and it's become less and less true. The parties have just diverged so much, and the stakes seem to be so high uh, that nobody was really willing to compromise at this point. And so when we note that, yes, the, these issues are popular, it's because the public isn't as divided as the elites are in American politics. And those, those elites, those voting representatives are largely shielded from these individual decisions. You know, the next election day is far from now. Uh, and it's pretty unlikely that they're gonna get punished for voting against it because it passed. And so if it ends up being popular, it was just sort of maybe a statement vote. Uh, you know, and they'll go to their constituents and they'll say, look, I, of course I supported this, but I really wanted to be a part of the process and the, the Biden administration locked me out. What do you want me to do? I have to vote against this. So there's so many ways that, that I think you can see people wiggle away from a, po from a popular idea. But I think you also have to just start at how divided we are as, as, as two people. And it's, it's, it's really hard to see a true bipartisan bill coming out of Congress at this point. All right, thank you. Scott, um, thank you for that so much depressing analysis. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I think very reflective of where our what are, what current American politics is. Um, Scott, would you um, like to comment about the the challenges of uh, of getting people to uh, follow news um, and distinguishing between news and commentary? Sure, not to do too much horn tooting about you know the fourth estate. Um, it's important that people. It's important that people check everything uh, that they hear. Uh, you can trust your news institutions because when they're wrong, they'll issue a correction. Um, you know, you can trust the New York Times, Newsday, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, institutions, and you shouldn't. Uh, the problem is we've heard for the last four years, fake news. So that has radicalized um, a huge segment of our population. So that's really concerning. When you hear a story and something doesn't sound right, you gotta, you know, look into the Washington Post and see see what they're saying about it. See what the Times has said about it. I mean, there was two stories that went viral over the last week that were just blatantly false. That, you know, the the Biden administration were were gonna ban red meat or for burgers, and um, they were gonna have, make plant burgers. Um, and then there was another one about, you know, the New York Post front page story about. Uh, the vice president making children read her book, uh, at, at, you know, when they were crossing the border. Uh, these were not true. And it's, it's important that, um, that people, you know, what, we take our jobs very seriously. When we hear things, we vet it. We check them out. We, we don't just publish things that we hear. And I mean, you know, we get a lot of emails from readers, um, you know, about Hunter Biden and, and things like that. And, you know, we, we will either run a wire story or make sure we're giving people uh, the vetted, you know, article about something. And uh, it's really important that 
you know, good professionals continue to go into journalism and, um, you know, understand that, you know, we have to provide context to what, uh, you know, has this happened before? You know, it, it, it's got to be done um, so, so that, you know, things aren't taken out of context. That's, that's the most important thing that I try to do and that we, we learn is to provide the right context um, to explain, you know, what's happening. Has this happened before? Is this a new thing? Because it's, it's very easy to have a knee-jerk reaction when someone says, I can't believe they're doing this. Um, and and that's, that's a problem. You'll, you're going to hear things. Uh, I hear things from people who watch, you know, Fox News or OAN or, I mean, it's just a completely different conversation. And um, a lot of it is radicalization that's going on. Um, so it's important that people check to see why aren't these stories covered in other media? How are they covering them? You know, is there this different prism? And um, so they don't creep into the discourse. Yeah. To, yeah. They don't penetrate into the discourse because you're seeing that with social media. You know, if you follow people who are not sharing truthful sources of, you know, truthful articles, um, it just multiplies and multiplies. And um, it, it's really harmful that, um, you know, kind of false stories or, or things that are, I mean, it's great to have a healthy news appetite. Don't just read the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal. Also to have, you know, a, a broad understanding of various institutions, financial, economic, but, you know, it, it's important that people, you know, have trust in, in, the, in the institutions and, and that the institutions are held accountable as well. No, thank you for bringing that up. And I think it's very important to note, not just um, that we as consumers of news, both in academia and in journalism, mm -hmm. that we be critical consumers, but also the importance of being the producers of news. Mm -hmm. I think with yeah. our audience today, we have many students in this audience I know that are political science, communications, yeah. journalism, the critical importance mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. um, of having reliable news available. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would add, you know, we're just, we're also at this multi, now multi-decade cycle of there's so many more sources of information. Mm -hmm. And it's now really easy for somebody to get on to one of those platforms and post a story about Hunter Biden flying to Ukraine and making everybody in the Ukraine government read their book uh, and then eating a meatless burger afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, and we've all kind of trained ourselves subtly to mm -hmm. accept less, um, uh, you know, sort of what, what we might call, uh, you know, trustworthy information. And that we do this in small increments. Mm -hmm. Every time you go on Amazon.com and you buy a product and you're using the reviews to guide which product you're going to buy, those are essentially a bunch of non-experts filtered mm -hmm. with a bunch of reviews that have probably been paid for might even be fraudulent. Mm -hmm. And that's just a part of our decision making now. And so some of the things that you hear, it's like, you know, if you really sit and think about the, are, are they really making them read a, a Vice President Harris's book at the border? It, it, on its face, it sounds ridiculous and it is ridiculous, but we've, I think, changed our brains enough by having so many different non-regulated sources of information that we hear something like that and go, yeah, that, yeah, that passes somehow in a way that mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to think it wouldn't have passed muster 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, there are, sorry, there are outrageous stories happening all the time. And, you know, you, you hear things and you, you, they do check out sometimes, but you, know, you have to make sure they go through the process. Correct. And if I'm correct, just since we've been discussing the vice president, the story about the vice president's book, as I read, I believe there was a giveaway box of books and there was one copy of the vice president's book in that box. Right. It was called oh, that turned into a news story. Oh, no, a photo saw. Yeah. It was just surprise. Let me just say, we, we have several student questions. So I'm just going to, to, to recognize Dr. Parati's point when we were discussing uh, public opinion and how uh, the lack of bipartisanship, Dr. Parati says institutions are not responsive to the majority. And Dr. Labresco pointed out gerrymandering um, and the structure of the Senate means that Republicans do not be need to be responsive to the people though businesses do, which is why businesses came out against Georgia voting restrictions. I'll just put that out there again, that's in the chat for people to think about. I'd like to shift 
focus on, as we're discussing information, to talking about elections. And um, Dr. Burnett, could you uh, pull up the poll about um, the tw November 2020 election results? I'm sorry, the slide that you had on that. You mean the um, one uh, who actually won? Yeah. Because this is a question, this came directly to me and I, and I did want to get to this. Um, it said, do you think the, this discrepancy has to do with Biden's predecessor spreading election fraud claims since November, 2020? Um, and let me just kind of, uh, kind of pick up on that and say, right, if, if this is a question, this kind of continues our discussion of information. How does one counter uh, claims, particularly when they're given by elected officials who have a much bigger platform to convey information than the general public. You alluded earlier, Dr. Burnett, right, to the that divisions among political elites may not reflect divisions in the public. This is a pretty active debate in political science now. But how do we do the, um, to what degree do allegations of information fraud potentially influence these survey results? And how can they be counted? Uh, look, you're either in or you're out on this. And you know, the, the, it's a very, it's, in some ways, it's the easiest problem in the world to fix. And, and in other ways, you and I, after I tell you how to fix it, no, it won't happen. Uh, it took, if you wanted to never have this problem, it would have taken an overwhelming response on the Republican side after the election was over to say, congratulations, President Biden and then strongly encourage the, uh, President Trump to concede and go out in a very you know, sort of presidential fashion, um, clearly showing to everybody, uh, but in particular, those who don't, you know, don't believe that it was, it was fair uh, or that he actually won, that this, this has happened and it was done legitimately and that this was a correct transfer of power. Um, that's not what happened, not even by a long shot. And you could still go a long way into having those ex current Republican leaders do the same thing, but they've consistently refused to do so, right? There hasn't been widespread acknowledgement. Um, you, and, and unfortunately for, for, I think, American politics, uh, former President Trump has been leading this. And, and, and even months afterwards is still you know, not saying, hasn't, hasn't conceded the election, right? He's still is telling uh, the same sorts of things that we, we know are wrong. And unfortunately, until the opinion leaders change on this, I, I don't see much movement on, on this front because this, this is following precisely exactly what uh, public opinion models would tell us when the elites diverge on their opinion on an issue, even this issue, uh, you're gonna see a polarized response, which is precisely what's happening here. Thank you. Scott, um, any comments on that? In terms of um, disinformation, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, people, it, it's, a, it's contagious what, what's going on. And um, I think people just have to remain vigilant. And, you know, you, you hope, um, you know, social media platforms kind of filter out uh, the wrong the wrong information, um, but it's it's a problem that needs to be needs to be tackled. And uh, you know, the, there there are these these channels, OAN, and you know, people have said, do we call on you know networks to uh, providers? Do we do we have accountability there? You know, you might see things like that happen, um, but. Um, I don't know, it's becoming more, do you engage or do you not engage? Do you, you know, it's that old, when they go high, we go look, you know, when they go oh, low, high, you know. <laughs> so it's just, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, um, I, think, I think organizations and political people are becoming more strategic about what to respond to, but it's, it seems like it's, the radical there's a radicalization going on and it's it's it you know it continues and what's interesting is that a lot of the news channels now don't really focus on the policy um some conservative media you know they just start talking about culture war issues like dr seuss and and things like that um i've heard some you know media analysts kind of bring up the claim that they're not really 
looking into, you know, President Biden and the administration, they just kind of attacking. Um, so you might see more of that kind of attacking like culture war fair versus actual policy. And, and that's kind of an evidence in this, in this poll that 33% fewer people are following, are oh, thinking about yeah. yeah, right, right. So fair, it's an, fair point. an echo chamber too. Right. Well, let me just say, and I, Dr. Lucas pointed out that OAN uh, will not refer to uh, President Biden uh, when they discuss the White House, which kind of picks up on some of the problems that you just identified. We have several questions in the chat. I'm going to try to get to two more at least. The first one is directly on public opinion uh, question framing. Uh, so I think Dr. Bernat, this one's for you. For you, how difficult is it to tell how much of public opinion is biased? by the phrasing of polls or framing of issues in the media, so that also applies to Scott, uh, and how much is based on actual feelings? And the student gives an example, Republicans not approving of Biden's tax cuts. Those were, I mean, not officially tax cuts, though in effect they were, even though they normally like that. Uh, so some of it is purely uh, zero sum game. Uh, mentality that we see between the parties that, yes, Republicans uh, probably normally do like tax cuts. I mean, they certainly legislate that way. So we got to assume that they like them. Um, but under these circumstances, and this, by the way, would have been the same, I think, if, if Trump had actually done something with health care that people liked and thought was an improvement. Democrats would have been like, no, that's terrible. We can't do that. It's because any success for the other side is a defeat for yours. So some of that has to come into play under, under current political conditions. Um, the, the, the core question about how much is due to framing, let me just sort of say that you know, we've done two framing experiments in this in this poll, but every question that we write uh, has the most plain stripped out version we could possibly write. And we try to have zero framing at all. In fact, most public opinion people would tell you uh, their goal is to have zero framing, to have zero bias in any question that they ask. And the truth of the matter is it's an art form. It's not a science, right? There are best practices. There are things that you want to do. It's, but you can't, you know, there is no standard perfect question that one can ask. So there invariably will be some kind of bias in any question. But when you explicitly frame things, you're trying to figure out, and, and our purpose was to figure out what are sort of the upper and lower bounds of things if you actually describe it a different way. Something that really kind of mirrors and I think mimics what happens in the political arena where the issues are really talked about in two very different ways. They're highlighting different costs versus different benefits or downplaying the benefits and highlighting just the cost. And that's what framing does. In most public opinion surveys, and I would have to say in reputable public opinion firms, right? they're, they're trying to do the exact opposite of framing an issue. They're trying to give the public enough information so they know what they're asking about and then ask them in a very plain way. Uh, so, you know, always going to be a little bit of bias no matter what, but I think in general, uh, unless you're, you're looking at something that is from uh, what you probably wouldn't call a reputable public opinion firm, you know, if you're looking at ABC News, Fox News, uh, CNN, you know, any of these these places that run their own big uh, polls, they're they're going to be doing that a professional job on all of the questions. So uh, if you notice big things like the Republicans normally like this, but they don't like it when Biden says it, that has more to do with partisanship than it has with the way the question is being asked. Let me just say, we, we are almost at the end of this. Um, I think, Scott, if you have a kind of a quick 30 seconds on kind of the challenge of framing from a journalist's perspective, right? We were talking about the survey, but obviously this comes up with news reporting every day, and then I'll just wrap this up. <laughs> sure, we, yeah, we make sure that, you know, we're not being uh, too incendiary, uh, but we do want to say sometimes the most direct uh, thing we have to say, and, uh, you know, the most you know, that captures the issue and we try to go into as much nuance as possible, but we're, you know, we're always looking at, you know, is this the right word and tone and things like that. 
important for all of us, I think, in surveys and our writing, scholarship, news, to try to be as accurate as possible in what we convey and, and what remains to be discussed. Um, and with that, let me just say, I'm sorry we didn't get to the question about why uh, the progressive wing is not putting more pressure on the Biden administration to push the policy window. Let me just answer that um, and say that I think what we saw in Congressman Bowman's response yesterday, the progressive response to Biden's address to Congress, President Biden's address, um, I think what we're seeing there is a push for action now. And I think we'll see in the next few months where whether um, if Congress passes, the legislation that the president has uh, supported. Um, I think the progressive wing is focusing on unity now within the Democratic Party. That could change. We have left so many questions for further discussion, and I am just delighted um, to have had the chance to have this conversation with um, our students, faculty, with Mr. Scott Eidler, Dr. Craig Burnett. Thank you both so much for um, your insights today for sharing the Calico School poll results, uh, Dr. Burnett, for writing about our uh, analysis, uh, uh, doc, uh, Mr. Eidler, and sharing it in Newsday. And many, many thanks to our colleagues at Hofstra and to the students for taking the time to join us today. Thank you very much. There will be a recording available. Um, it will probably be, uh, I think it will go to everyone who registered and we will make sure that the um, that faculty get it to share with students as well. Thank you all very much.